Thank you very much. It's my great pleasure. It's an honor to do this uh, uh, Teach March lecture, lecture, as was uh, said, and it's my great pleasure also to have been introduced by John Ball, with whom I have worked so many times over the past years about matters of policy of uh, science. I'm not sure which was my last visit to Oxford, but I remember vividly giving a seminar here in um, 2008 on the invitation of Terry Lyons and a subject which since then has grown to proportions that I thought uh, would be impossible. Anyway, it's great to be back here, especially in this uh, new beautiful building, and uh, to do this uh, exercise in which one has to address an audience ranging from end of high school to distinguished university professor at the same time. So let's go on with uh, recalling some things about uh, mathematics nowadays, a kind of particular science. Mathematicians know it, of course, non-mathematicians uh, have to be aware. And I like to remind of an event which was not unnoticed by some people a few years ago when the Wall Street Journal decided to make a ranking of all the possible jobs on the face of the earth that they could think of. And what came out first, of course, you may be guessing, if I am quoting these statistics, it may be good news for the mathematician. <laughs> and indeed, it was mathematician number one here. Of course, they put the poor lumberjack last. <laughs> some of you may know some lumberjacks and feel depressed, but don't. These kind of rankings we know is total crap. <laughs> but but here, the first rank, the first ranking, the first place, it has some truth in it, for sure. <laughs> so, mathematician, number one, and in 2014, they did it again, and they put again mathematician at the first place. Now, they're, they're a company called CareerCast, doing prospection of what will be the jobs of the future, and so on. And uh, they have this point that mathematician is very well adapted to a very moving future because by definition mathematics can adapt to any kind of problem and situation and also a world in which is much and much more dominated by exchanges of and processing of information or driven through computers which is a way to bring mathematics to real life so to speak. What was the definition that our colleagues from Wall Street Journal use? That's interesting. Mathematician is somebody who applies mathematical theories and formulas to teach or solve problems in a business, educational or industrial climate. Now that's good, in particular the fact that they use the word solve problems because mathematics was invented to solve problems, was created or discovered to solve problems, and has been doing so for many, many years, for thousands of years, arguably. And uh, still there is something missing for the definition to be complete, because, of course, mathematician is also somebody who creates new mathematics. Because mathematics is not just something which is given and that you apply. It is also something which is in constant evolution, continuous evolution. And it's good to remind that around the Earth now there are maybe a couple of hundreds of thousands of mathematicians and uh, maybe as many theorems proven per year. It's a very rapidly evolving field, also driven by interaction with other sciences and driven by interaction with the technology, or more and more. It has been estimated a few years ago that mathematical research was accounting for 16% of the gross, gross value added in the UK economy. There was a study quantifying this. When the results arrived, many mathematicians said, wow, how did they do this study and so on? And in the end, it was not so bad. The, the, 
the, the way they handle the process and so on, which is very complicated because we have all kinds of indirect effects, was not so bad. Actually, in France, we are doing the same study nowadays. As usual, we'll see if the different uh, terminology, different uh, procedure and so on might lead to different results. But one thing for sure, whatever the precise result, mathematics is playing a very important role in today's economy, in today's technology, and this role is increasing and increasing year after year. And also people are getting it now, for instance, in culture, in the leisure industry and so on. I remember a few years ago a big conference in San Diego, the Joint Mathematical Meeting. In one of the, uh, in one of the sessions there was um, the director of research of some big studio making movies, some major, and uh, he was saying to an audience of uh, delighted mathematicians, we should pay you guys royalties for every blockbuster which is out in Hollywood, given the amount of mathematical research that we use. Old equations, new equations, numerical schemes, and so on. It plays a more and more important role in the movie industry also. While speaking, I am noticing that the power is not here, so there might be, if we don't do something, it might turn off at the middle of the talk. Mm, hold on. Ah, it's just okay. It's just a fragile contact. Okay, we solved the technological problem. Um, yes. One important thing about mathematics also, and that's the reason on this slide, which I will not go through in every detail, it's very impressionistic. There are figures from the past and also figures from the distant path, past. Because we also live with them. Every mathematician knows we are friends with the mathematicians from the past using their ideas and they are still there. For instance, I put Fourier, I put Turing, there is Shannon, there is Laplace, and so on. One of the most important theorems in mathematics is the central limit theorem. It says whenever you're looking at an experiment which is repeated a large number of times, a random experiment repeated many, many times, and you want to know which is the deviation of the observed statistics with respect to the theoretical statistics, with respect to the mean, uh, these fluctuations are Gaussian, with a large probability of being small and a small probability of being large. And the first proof of this was by Laplace, beginning of the 19th century. And uh, this thing is still an extremely important theorem, still used in many fields and so on. And uh, conversely, uh, every, all of these uh, things, all of these contributions get enriched and get new developments in the light of current world and current technology. Let's take one example, just one, the Fourier analysis. So here comes Fourier, about the same time as Laplace. Fourier worked on the Fourier transform and Fourier analysis of which the two basic equations are the ones appearing on the left of Fourier here. It's written here in very compact form. Just suffice to know that the theory is a theory on which you can write books of hundreds of pages, but also which can be summarized in a very small number of equations in a very compact form. And still is extremely useful, extremely applied, and that's the strength of mathematics, because it is based on abstraction, it can be applied to a number of concrete situations. It also draws inspiration from a number of concrete situations. So we have this kind of branching, the real world going in many different ways to the abstract concept, the abstract concept going back in many different ways to the real world. The Fourier technique of looking which are at which are the frequencies in a given signal were first applied by Fourier to study the evolution of the heat in a material. Say you have a piece of metal, you are heating some place, you want to know how the heat will propagate, how it will cool down, and so on. And it has been used to so many different things. 
Now we use Fourier analysis to study the sounds of birds, because it's a signal, even though so different from the signal of Fourier. We use Fourier analysis for images. This is famous picture of beautiful Lina used in all studies of uh, image processing, and this is the beautiful Fourier transform of Lina. And this is used as a way to benchmark, to test, to communicate. Fourier analysis is uh, used worldwide whenever there is need of analyzing, analyzing the variations of the signal in an image. And it's used also in medical devices like this, when you are having a scanner, RMN, and then it's basically doing a Fourier transform of your body. And uh, that's how you get some information. Then you have to apply the Fourier formulas to invert the Fourier transform and get back to the information. Here, how to get back from the Fourier transform to Lena, that's a mathematical problem. How to get back from your Fourier transform to the images of your, your organs, that's also a problem. And this gets mixed with all kinds of new techniques, of course. At the last uh, International Congress of Mathematicians in Seoul, there was plenary talk by Emmanuel Candès, French mathematician working in Stanford, specialist of uh, what is called uh, various techniques related to uh, machine learning, artificial intelligence, so to speak, and uh, uh, sparsity. And he explained how, by working with uh, people from uh, some hospital, he managed to apply the right mathematical techniques based on Fourier transform analysis. He was able to divide by eight the time that it takes somebody to <coughs> be in the scanner to get the information collected, with important consequences, in particular when it comes to curing children. And this is, of course, the blending of uh, old Fourier techniques with new techniques coming, in this case, from mixture of statistics, geometry, whatever. In one of these uh, experiments, in one of these other uh, parts of, this, uh, of his talk, uh, Candace was uh, describing us results of work he had done in collaboration with Terry Tao and other people, in which from a Fourier transform image of some organism, some body, you delete 98% of the information and still are able to reconstruct it to such accuracy that you cannot distinguish the original and the modification with your bare eyes. So these are techniques that show how you can blend the old and the new mathematics in this, and also show that it is constantly renewed to adapt to new constraints and goals and technologies. So that's for commenting on the status of the mathematical knowledge and the mathematical science. Now, this so far was a kind of rosy picture, but the life of a mathematician is not so rosy. It is suffering every day and failure every day. I remember very well our, uh, our common friend, uh, I'm thinking of John uh, Craig Evans from Berkeley, saying exactly these words, every day is a failure. Because you're searching and it doesn't work, it doesn't work and it doesn't work. And still, in the end, when you walk, when you look back, say 10 years, a very period of 10 years, you're amazed to see how much has been done and how much progress has been made. That's because mathematics, as any science, is globally cooperative. And so there's a lot and a lot of progress done very fast through the joint efforts of everybody. But at the scale of the individual, it's permanent suffering, so to speak. Well, still, it is quite thrilling. If you don't have the suffering, then you are not happy to win. So here we are anyway, that's the typical way of working, thinking and not finding and waiting for Poincaré to <laughs> whisper some hint in our ears, you know. How will this occur? Sometimes there are these experiments in which the solution seems to be coming who knows from where. Ramanujan used to say that there was some goddess whispering to his ear during sleep or something. I uh, personally experienced a couple of 
wonderful, wonderful things. Uh, one is I tell in the book uh, that I will describe in more detail later. So imagine there I was, it was in Princeton, and there I was some evening working alone, uh, trying to fix some proof that doesn't work. I had already announced the result publicly, so I was uh, <laughs> under monster pressure to fix the damn proof, and there was this problem, and where this problem comes from, I have to fix this. 1 a.m., 2 a.m., 3 a.m., nothing occurs, no solution. I, in the end, get go to bed completely desperate, and in the morning, just wake up, what is it? And then there is, in my, in my, in my brain, really, the voice saying, put the second term on the other side and take Fourier transform. And that was it. That was the beginning of the solution. So powerful is the unconscious brain, you know, continuing to work even though you're thinking you have abandoned. Where does this come from? That's a key problem, and we would pay a lot to know how to trigger this. Now, even when you have the good idea, comes another problem, which is convince your colleagues. Yes, books of, about history of science are full of stories, tragic stories like Galois or Abel, for instance, of scientists who did not manage to convince their peers that they were looking in the right direction. This uh, one is a symbol of something even more compelling. This is Ignaz Semmelweis, the first one to understand the importance of cleaning for medical doctors. And you know, if you're a medical doctor and you are doing a dissection of a corpse and just later that day you are helping some woman to give birth, it's good to wash hands in, be in between. <laughs> well, it looks like so obvious now, but it was not at the time. There would be tremendous death rates in the hospitals. And uh, this guy just became crazy, literally trying and not managing to convince his colleagues about this, doing experiments, whatever. So this is a, an example. Of course, science, in the end, corrects the mistakes, and people understood, and there was all this movement about bacteria, about hygiene, and so on. But it may be longer than at the scale of an individual. And scientists, in practice, are not so much better than other people for changing ideas. Science is very good at changing theory, but scientists often get uh, used to a theory and fall in love with it and are very reluctant when somebody tells them, you know, that's not the right way. Anyway, so convincing the peers is another of these obstacles. And then another thing that occurs to you, another, I will not say plague, but disease, is the problem of people asking you to tell the future. It can be journalists asking you, oh, Professor Villani, what will be mathematics in 2050? Well, what the hell do I know? I don't answer this on the, on the television, but sometimes I answer with this quote by Poincaré. And before I read the quote by Poincaré, let me say that it may be annoying when you have a journalist asking you to do this predicting job, but it's also annoying when it's a government or institution, for instance asking you to justify for the use of the money that you receive and predicting what results you can prove in one year, two years, three years, four years, and so on. What do we know? Most of the good results, they arise without you foreseeing it by surprise. And uh, you should never try to try and predict too much. So here's his point carrying. Somebody, some journalist, is asking him, now we are in 1900, what, is the, what will be the science of the 20th century? And Poincaré answers, Monsieur, your letter is coming to me, arriving to me after uh, some time. If in 1800 one had asked to any scientist what would be science of the 19th century, how much nonsense he would have said, good heaven. This thought forbids me to answer. I think that surprising results shall be obtained. And that's precisely the reason why I cannot say anything about them. Because if I could foresee them, what surprise would there remain in them? So please excuse my silence. 
So this Poincaré quote, as I said, I already used, saying that you can never predict the future of the science. Now, if you think a bit more, and that will be the subject of the talk, I think that surprising results shall be obtained is more than just playing with the concepts and, and words. It is also a certain belief in the fact that there will always be uh, inventive people discovering new things that their teachers, their masters, have not predicted. And that point is the fundamental problem of higher education. To many people in the audience it is obvious, but let's reassert this. The important thing of education and the problem of master and student is to train the student in such a way that he can have new ideas that the master did not have. So, and uh, I put on these slides uh, some examples of people who, with just a few ideas, revolutionized the story of the 20th century and people that Poincaré could never have imagine their contributions, or people who are emblematic of all these things which happened in the world of ideas of 20th century. I also put a picture of a university here. I'm sorry, I should have put Oxford when coming here. But I put a, a picture of famous university to remind of what I just said. What makes the value of a university, of higher institution or something, is not the fact that students there are told the best science of the day, is the fact that the students will one day go out and do science which is better than what they were taught. That's the principal problem, the most important, and nobody really knows how to do this. But still, we have to solve this problem. Um, here on the right, let's start with him, Alan Turing. As we know, there's the Hollywood movie around, and uh, Turing uh, is Remarkable and uh, exemplifies, first, power of ideas, of course, and as we know, one of the main fathers of computer theory, but also how much it can change history. We know there was his role in Second World War. He was involved in the deciphering of the Enigma Code, in particular the one for submarines. And when you read details and accounts of the story there, the role of Turing and so on, it is clear first that there would not have been an efficient solution to solve this without his particular input. And second, that without this, uh, the story of Second World War could have been completely different. In 1944, the Normandy event would not have been possible. The war would have lasted probably at least two more years. Anything was possible. It's amazing to think that during the four last years of the, of the war, the uh, Allied coalition was able to read all the messages of the Germans, and still it was so damn difficult. So let's imagine what it would have been without that single idea. The, to the left of Turing is Paul Erdős, the most prolific mathematician of the 20th century. Also emblematic of the fact that Ideas and creativity, it's also a geopolitical issue, social issue. And uh, there was a, a tremendous event also during Second World War, a huge, a huge migration of ideas of, and the idea ecosystem from Europe to America, with all these very bright uh, Jews who were expelled and their friends and laboratories coming with and so on. Some of them extremely dedicated, some of them changing the whole of science. Erdős was uh, one of these, and as uh, according to the facts we know of his biography, he, there was this guy with no home, no family apart from his mother, uh, no possessions, no car, no job, nothing but suitcase with a few belongings, and ideas, ideas, ideas. And there were many like this, doing this wandering job and changing the face of the world ecosystem of ideas during the 20th century. To the left of Erdős is Leo Szilard, not so well known, but a key person also during the same period. Szilard was the first human being to have the idea of a nuclear chain reaction. And he told how this occurred, 
This was in London. He had read uh, the account of a lecture by Rutherford, the father of atomic physics, the father of nuclear physics. And Rutherford was saying something like, yeah, there is some energy in the atom, but it's so tiny. Anybody who would want to extract something from it would be talking moonshine, like be a dreamer and so on. And Silat was very annoyed by this. And just by contradiction spirit, he wanted to prove him wrong. So thinking, 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 no solution, no solution. And one day, crossing the street and staring at some light, whatever, green light becomes red. And ah, here was the idea, chain reaction. And he had the idea of the principle and so on. This was 1933. And uh, see how, how this could, could change things. Just at that time, he had the... He had the feeling, he knew that German physics, the most advanced of the time, was the, in the best position to devise this weapon. And so frightened that the idea would get into the wrong ears. This is the patent which uh, Fermi and Szilard made for nuclear reactor. So Szilard also was the guy who wrote the letter for Einstein the letter which was sent to the President of the United States, and in the end was the start of a program that involved more than 100,000 people. Just one idea at the beginning. And uh, here we see on these examples the power of ideas it can be just one brain with the right configuration, and then it is multiplied by the power of collaboration in technology projects, in scientific projects. So here are some of these people. In, there is this element in some of the, for instance, in the Silat story, which I also already told, uh, which is uh, the fact that it's unpredictable when the illumination will come. In science, in research, we all know this. There are the small illuminations, the big illuminations. Henri Poincaré, in a famous text, wrote about some of his illuminations, for which he was famous. In one of these stories, he says, he tells about like the moment I put the foot on the marche pied, that is when he put the foot on the stairs, that is to climb back in some bus, then comes the illumination. And there was nothing related to the, to the problem he was uh, striving to solve in this bus. But just the idea was there, as he was doing something completely different. Here is another passage of the same Poincaré text. Disgusted by my failure, I went to spend a few days on the seaside thinking something completely differently. One day, while walking on a cliff, the idea came to me. Always with the same features, very brief, sudden and immediate certainty that arithmetic transforms of indefinite, ternary, quadratic forms are identical to those of non-Euclidean geometry. A few remarks on this. So this is part of a long text about it. First, even for people in the audience who don't know about quadratic forms, they see that there is nothing comparable to walking on the cliff. So in some popular representation, there are these ideas of the Eureka moment coming like when you have this guy, Archimedes, in his bath, and then the idea for the, for the Archimedes thrust, or Newton, and the apple in this legend, and then the idea for gravitation, and so on, and the idea being triggered by something which has some relation with the problem. These are usually legends. Here, it is completely different. There is no relation whatsoever between the cliff and the illumination. Just it's taking you by surprise, and that's often the case. The second is that Poincaré insists on the fact that he's first disgusted by his failure, which means long period of working hard on the problem, then making a break, and then arrives the illumination. The process described by Poincaré is not pure work, not pure illumination, it's alternating between both. And uh, that's also typical, I guess. By the way, I see there are some young people listening, if someday you know you have this big math exam to prepare and you need to go and meet your friends at the pub, 
some evening. You can tell your parents you are applying the Poincaré method to prepare. <laughs> and maybe it will work fine. <laughs> Especially if you say it was told to you by a big French professor anyway. So, uh, the final remark on the text is that uh, uh, here Poincaré put the big words without explanation, and he says in the text, they will be technical words, but don't worry. You don't need to understand them, only the circumstances matter. And I think that's one of the reasons why the text was successful. If Poincaré had tried to explain it, okay, let's do it slowly, I will explain to you what is a quadratic form, then a ternary quadratic form, what is it indefinite, I will explain to you what is the Euclidean geometry and so on, so much of the audience would have been lost even if Poincaré was very pedagogical, and the important fact, which is the illumination moment, would be buried in those explanations. So the fact that Poincaré put the technical words without explanation, I think was important in the success of this uh, writing. And uh, I did the same in uh, my book, Theorem Vivant, Living Theorem, Birth of the Theorem, actually without being aware of it. It's another instance of this. I knew the Poincaré text, but while writing the book, I did not realize I was applying to a larger scale the same uh, technique as Poincaré. It looked natural to me. You know, we also know this in mathematics, very often that there is some guy call, coming and telling us, I have this great idea, let's do this and this, and you tell him, yes, that's what I explained to you one month ago. <laughs> because you hear something and then you appropriate it just to yourself. So for the record, by the way, when I wrote the, the book, uh, the, my original title was Naissance d'un Théorème. And French publishers were not so happy. They said, it's too explicit, let's do something a bit more mysterious. Anyway, we had discussion and I came out with Théorème vivant. And he said, that's good. And then it was to the English publishers. And the English publisher said, oh, Théorème Vivant, you know, it's a bit mysterious. We don't understand it. <laughs> and so they came back and said, why not birth of the theorem? And I said, OK, let's do it. <laughs> Subtle details are always interesting when you go in the translations. Anyway, in this book, uh, it's exactly the same. I focused on the circumstances. Nowadays, there are very fine books about explaining about mathematics, what is the science developed like, uh, what's the theory doing, the history of the subject, and so on. But here I wanted something complementary. The daily life of a mathematician, in his struggle, in the emotions. And actually, it was not my idea initially. It was because I met that other publisher. This was in some uh, dinner. This was before the Fields Medal, and the guy was saying, OK, why don't we try and publish a book together, and so on. I told him, OK, I have uh, ideas. I could write a book on entropy. I'm supposed to be one of the world experts. There are all these. It's fascinating. It's important, and so on. He didn't care the least. <laughs> and all the only thing he cared was, but what is it to be a mathematician? What do you do? What do you think? How do you work, and so on? And so I was embarrassed how to describe this. And then I thought, after all, we spend part of our time explaining kids and so on that science is an adventure. So let's write it as a novel, as an adventure. So I took a theorem of mine, a theorem charged with a lot of emotion, a theorem which had been a difficult story, and I wrote how it was the genesis of the theorem. Like adventure novel, but everything in there was true. And so, that's what is behind the scene. Usually when we talk of a theorem, it's after publication, and once the theorem is ready to walk and to be used. But all the process that is before, that's the life of the researcher, the mathematician, what goes behind the scenes. And that's a long process. And how you're going to look for it? What will you be trying to prove? This also is important, and this is part of what you learn with the experience. So the first chapter of the book is, I like to say, it's like fecundation. There's discussion between me and my former student Clément Mouault, 
and the main collaborator at the time, and we are discussing about some problem. And in the discussion, because he remembers some conversation from two years before with somebody, I remember another conversation from somebody else from last year, we put these together and said, but this maybe has to do with the Landau damping. It was completely not our subject initially. It was not what we wanted to work on, it was different, but then we said, okay, let's try, it was coincidence, let's try and go for it. And uh, then, it's a long story, first deciding which is the statement we're going to prove, how it's related to physics, how we're going to chase it, and so on. Two years and a half, in various places, a uh, large part of it while I'm in Princeton and he's in Paris and communicating by email, many times in which we are making mistakes, erring, many uh, several coups de théâtre, several times in which there is conversation with somebody that takes us out of the predicament, and so on. And so I told this all in an impressionistic way, like this difficulty, that difficulty, how we solved it, and so on. And also with all the environment. How we do it, so there will be description of that night that you are spending alone with your cup of tea and uh, working and working endless computations. But there's also that moment in which you are discussing with your colleague and the colleague doesn't agree with you and this will give you a new idea. Or there is a moment in which your first attempt of publication gets rejected and you are reading the rejection letter and so sad. Or there's a moment in which you are putting everything together and you are so excited and so forth. That's the life, that's the real life of a mathematician. And that, as the life of all other human beings, it's full of emotions. Also, I put the formulas straight and as they were and the language as it is. So the object, which is the theorem, which is the hero of the book, because we are witnessing the way it develops into something organized, start from chaos, becomes organized little by little, in such a way that you can publish it in the end. And so we're witnessing the various stages, with extracts of the paper, with uh, scribblings, with formulas, and so on. And uh, it was a bit of a gamble. There is this famous quote by Hawking, Stephen Hawking, saying, uh, well, actually advice from his editor, don't put any formulas. Each formula will divide by two the number of readers. If uh, the rule was really true, there would not have been a single reader for the book. <laughs> Maybe a few molecules of reader someplace, <laughs> given the amount of formulas which I put. Some readers told me they spent as much time reading the formulas as reading the text. Just contemplating, by the way, that the first one of the, that's the first book I am aware of, which has been entirely, uh, for broad audience, entirely typeset in, in tech. Maybe, you know, Marcus, did you write books in tech? No. <laughs> so this was, this was quite a, an experiment. Anyway, what is the story which I tell? Before that, let me mention that uh, near the publication of the book, in which, as I said, the, the hero is the theorem, I became aware of this uh, amazing book by Francis Pufford. I guess he's a Cambridge scholar, uh, Red Plenty, in which in his own words, the hero is an idea, and that idea is mathematical panification of economy. And we see it through it, the story of the Soviet economy, from the boom of the 50s to the collapse of the 90s, let's say. And uh, here it is told in such a way that we see the idea interacting, the abstract idea interacting in many ways with the humans. And at times it works beautifully, at times it's a disaster. Leonid Kantorovich, one of my personal heroes, is also the first hero of the, of the book. And uh, here also there was this idea that there is this idea and see its uh, interference with the world of humans. Now, a little bit, just a little bit of uh, mathematics. What is it that we proved? By the way, which, Alain, which time should I aim at stopping? Okay, super. So, uh, in the book, we are working on the problem of mathematical physics, and the problem is related to plasma physics. Problem is about stability. Problem is about relaxation. Stability is such an important property in the world, and we, are, we have every kind of stability arises around us, but the most important are the ones coming from friction. Uh, we learn in school, hear about the laws of Galileo, 
that if there is a ball and you kick this ball, it will go on forever straight with constant speed. And of course, you do the experiment in class and of course the ball stops after a few meters. So what you are being taught in school is false. Well, it's because of the frictions. And friction is monsterly powerful force for stability. Friction is related to irreversible phenomena, phenomena in which something is dissipated, like you are hitting something and the heat is cooling down, and uh, all kinds of phenomena in which there is something which doesn't go very perfectly or not perfectly at all, something is lost, some information is lost, disorder is increasing, entropy is increasing, as the physicists say. At, to our, at our scale, there is another powerful force of stability, the fact that we are all feeling the extraction of the Earth, keeping us uh, down in place. When, by the, and we saw it when there was this, what was it, uh, Philae landed on this asteroid some time ago. Almost no gravity made it so unstable, it jumped at crazy distances from the asteroid. But now, in gas, there is some analogue of the friction. There is this phenomena of increase of entropy, in which I worked, and many people worked at theoretical or practical level. But a plasma is like a miraculous, perfect, uh, perfect state of matter in which there is no friction and nothing irreversible. Almost nothing. Plasma is when you have imposed such conditions that the electrons have been ripped away from the nuclei. These electrons, they interact through the good old laws, like they have negatively charged, so they repel each other, they are very light, so they, are, they move very quickly. And uh, it's important, technologically speaking and theoretically, to understand how a plasma works. So it's a problem which is grounded in physics. And uh, even though there is no entropy increase, Landau, in the 40s, suggested that there was some stability mechanism there. And he argued using the Vlasov equation, which is at the basis of plasma physics. So our physicists can see all these beautiful different states for plasma. Mathematicians will see that primarily it's this beautiful equation. And that's the equation you have to work on to understand this stability. It's the same equation, by the way, which is used in galactic dynamics and also in certain instances of fluid dynamics. So the same problems of stability arise in these areas. And to convince people, Landau used mathematical reasoning and the good old Fourier transform in particular. And most of all, he used the linear approximation. The equation is nonlinear. Let's simplify it and turn it into a so-called linear equation in which the response is always proportional to the input, roughly speaking. And is it true that the Landau reasoning applies to the real world, to the real plasma? This was not clear. Even there were arguments to suggest that this was false. And there was some debate. Some physicists saying yes, other no, mathematicians alike. And this is this problem particularly that we solved with uh, Clément Mou, showing that yes, the result, the reasoning of Landau does work for the nonlinear equation also. But then, this was quite more difficult than the linear, than the linear case, um, where the linear case is a couple of pages of computation, the nonlinear took us something like 150 pages of uh, reasoning and proofs and, uh, and computation, and most of all, demanded new ideas. So what is it that a mathematician can do with physics problems, even with physics problems which are known experimentally to hold, is to suggest a new interpretation and to make connection. Connections between various fields are one of the most powerful things that mathematicians can do. Finding the abstract links. And in particular, and this was a great surprise because neither Clément nor I had any suspicion of these connections, we find that the stability problem of uh, the plasma by uh, Landau was related to the stability problem of the solar system, in particular in the version suggested by Kolmogorov in the 1950s, and the paradox according to which sometimes something like a solar system behaves very well 
like planets will never collide, even though there is no physical law to force them to behave well. And also was related to a famous experiment done by Malmberg et al. called the plasma echo. Beautiful experiment. You send some pulse, electric pulse in the plasma, so there will be some electric field created by the electric pulse. And then you let the uh, electric field behave as it wishes. It will be damped spontaneously, after which time you send a second electric pulse at a different frequency. And let it behave and vanish. And then do nothing, and you will measure a spontaneous response of the plasma while it was quiet. This shows that plasmas are slightly weird objects. It also shows that plasma reacts with delay to some stimuli. And this delay we found was crucial to explain why it still worked in the nonlinear world. So the connection between these three paradoxical statements, the contributions of Landau, Kolmogorov, and Malmberg, was a crucial insight of us. And I told you the story in a few minutes, with plain words. They, before that, there were two years and a half of struggle and efforts and coincidences. The relation with Kolmogorov, by the way, the first one who suggested this was my colleague, Etienne Gis, geometer from Lyon, after hearing me discussing with some colleague about related facts. And the reason why he had this idea that there was a relation was totally wrong. I mean, he saw some pictures on, my, on the desk. He said, yeah, this reminds me of the Kolmogorov thing. But the, the, the drawing that I had done was precisely the case in which it did not work. <laughs> See these kind of coincidences? But uh, in research, it's important to be able to recognize when you have a piece of luck. And so I thought, OK, let's see if we can understand this. It took me one year to understand the, just the link, and so on. Let's uh, conclude by commenting on the list of the ingredients. Basically, everything I told so far was, yes, the inspiration is important. Yes, it's, that makes all the difference. But who knows how it comes? We don't know how the solution comes to you, but we know the ingredients that are important. And I will list seven ingredients which are so important in this job. And these seven ingredients, they all have an important place in the tale. The first is documentation. Documentation can be the old libraries, can be the virtual libraries, and so on. But there is no such thing as a mathematician working from scratch without any knowledge of the past. I put the Fadi Bruno's formula here because it was a detail, but uh, something typical of the New Deal posed by virtual information. At some point in the work, we need a formula for iterated derivatives of the composition of functions. And I think, gosh, I think there's a formula. Maybe 15 years ago, I heard something like this in my studies. No idea what the formula was called, no idea where to look for it, whatever. But then, with search engine and a few seconds and the right keywords, get the formula, the history, the range of application, anything you want. So this is a new deal in the sense that getting, uh, finding the information when you have the idea what you're looking for is not a problem. But still, you need to have the right ideas. And it changes the way we, 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 we live with this. But still, these libraries, all these uh, results of experiments and so on, are so important. Constructions from the past. The second ingredient is probably the most important, but is the most elusive. It's the motivation. Nobody knows how people are motivated. Sometimes it's just that they have this inspiration from a book that they read when they are a child. Here I put a picture of Donald in Mass Magic Land. I was watching this when I was a little kid. I saw it much later. I thought, wow, is this naive? But still, I found it so uh, fascinating. Maybe this had a great influence in me becoming a mathematician later. Sometimes it's a teacher. It is known that all the career of Alan Turing was inspired from a book he read when he was 10 years old. Natural Wonders, every child should know. So this is the power of impressing, impregnating the brain of young children sometimes. And uh, all countries in developed, all developed countries currently are striving for this because they see motivation, lack of motivation, as the main threat on science nowadays. If not enough young people do it, then who is going to make science? 
And that's why many people are working the beautiful books of popularizing science. And also some pedagogical experiments are being conducted. Here's one, black autumn bees done in, uh, done in, in London with a, with a researcher working with kids, 10-year-old children, 8 to 10-year-old children from school on some scientific experiment which was published in biology letters on animal behavior, showing that you can do science even when you're nine years old. Principal finding, we discovered that bumblebees can use a combination of color and spatial relationships in deciding which color of flower to forage from. We also discovered that science is cool and fun because you get to do stuff that no one has ever done before. It's, it's cute, right? Usually it is said that the principal finding should be something completely new. But on this particular example, it's a principal finding. It's important that people discover and rediscover. And uh, motivation. When you think of, when you have a big achievement to make monster obstacles to solve as a scientist, if you don't have enormous motivation, you just don't do it. The third is the ecosystem, the environment. Whenever in the story of mankind you look for the places where innovations are made, and at some time you know it's Persepolis, the most innovative city in the world, sometimes it's Paris, sometimes it's London, sometimes it's Budapest, whatever. The, it's always an environment, it's not single individuals. And that's your problem also when you are directing an institute of research. I've been director of Institut Henri Poincaré for five years and a half now, problem is to maintain the ecosystem. You are within an ecosystem, in this case Paris higher education ecosystem, but you are maintaining the small ecosystem inside so that the conversation and so on will trigger the new directions of research, as it triggered the start of the project I was talking about on Landau damping. The uh, next ingredient is the exchange. It, when the birth of the new project is mainly ecosystemic thing. But when you have started your project and you are working on it, it may be that it's two individuals or three individuals, a small number, and then the communication between them can be a matter of vital importance. In my case with Clément, most of it was done by email as we were on the two sides of the Atlantic, with emails every day. And uh, in the end, it's like you have these two brains working together and it's more than just the sum of the two. It's like a delocalized brain. Tim Gowers made these extraordinary experiments, Polymath Project, in which hundreds of mathematicians collaborate together on a, single, on a single problem. Is this a direction of research for the future, future way to do research? Is it an experiment, which also is interesting in itself, in the way that decision process is organized and so on? Who knows? But for sure this is interesting and uh, shows new possibilities from communication by technologies. The next ingredient which is so important is constraint. So it looks like paradoxical to say that constraints are important to creativity and research, but it's so damn important. In mathematics, we live with this constant constraint of having something totally rigorous, and if there is one mistake someplace, the whole proof will fall down. And uh, we need, of course, the rigor and so on. But it's, and it's no accident that mathematics is also a field in which creativity is so extraordinarily valued and prized. Uh, to take an analogy, poetry is a form of art in which constraints are monsters in uh, all kinds of, uh, of cultures, and still in which creativity and imagination is so much valued. Here I took examples coming from uh, other arts, one example from music in which the crazy constraint imposed on himself by Ligeti to write a short piece in which the only key, the only note is A, apart from the very last one, uh, forces him to do all kinds of variations on the rhythm, on the, on the strength and so on. You don't get bored at all by, use, by listening to this piece which is only made of A's. And the other one is this famous book by Georges Perec in which there is no E. The letter E has disappeared, even though this is a thick novel. And of course, the language in there doesn't re resemble that of any other book written in French language. It's very particular. And you have to find all these creative solutions to, to go around the constraint. The next ingredient I already talked about, but let's recall it explicitly, is the mixture of hard work, systematic, 
and illumination coming at some point, which Poincaré described so well. And the final ingredient is tenacity, because it's always or almost always wrong, and you throw your efforts in the, in the dustbin. With tenacity comes luck. They come together, and you need some luck to do the good things. Most importantly, to be able to recognize when you do have some luck. So this makes a lot of ingredients, and that's why it's very precious, these ideas when they come into shape. Let's quote this nice, yeah, maybe some people know this Electron Café drawing, I like a lot. This is what you are taught at school about how science works. Well, let's make the uh, hypothesis, experiment, conclusion, whatever. Think. It's not the way it works in practice. Practice is like this. You wonder with, find out someone did it, do science, instrument breaks, not as expected, amazing results, turn out to be crap, what the <laughs> hell is going on, thinking, yes, no, yeah, that's funny, this makes sense, ah, they figured this out 50 years ago, and then you're out <laughs> again and again. So, here the, 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 the cartoonist made this great job of describing the experiment, the, the experience of one scientist. But to get a more accurate picture, multiply this by the number of scientists and make all kinds of intertwining together, because these are all these stories also of interactions together. It's a very chaotic and confused process, from which has to come out something very rigorous and very sound. That's tricky, and that's the beauty of it. And two quotes to conclude about the nature of ideas, how precious they are, and what we should regard, how we should consider them. First is by Jefferson. Jefferson is so useful because whenever you have an argument about intellectual property with some American, because he's a founding father, you are quoting Jefferson and he can say nothing against this. <laughs> So what does Jefferson say? If nature has made any one thing less susceptible than all others of exclusive property, it is the action of the thinking power called an idea, which an individual may exclusively possess as long as he keeps it to himself. But the moment it is divulged, it forces itself into the possession of everyone, and the receiver cannot dispossess himself of it. Its peculiar character, too, is that no one possesses the less because every other possesses the whole of it. He who receives an idea from me receives instruction himself without lessening mind, as he who lights his taper at mine receives light without darkening me. In those days, politicians did speak so eloquently. <laughs> this is for Poincaré, the last word. Uh, thought is like a lightning strike in a long night, but it is this lightning which is everything. And with this, I will conclude. Thank you.